coming and uh, I think we can start the, uh, the talk now. Uh, my name is uh, Chin Srin. I am a program coordinator at the Center for Christ Studies. I uh, just want to introduce you a little bit to this uh, lecture and the idea behind inviting scholars to give like, a series, uh, public uh, lecture series like, like, like this uh, at the Center for Christ Studies. Uh, today's topic, as, as you know, it, it's about the uh, Vietnamese minorities in Cambodia, and as, uh, as presented in this uh, flyer, this is really a rare uh, research uh, piece on, on uh, especially Vietnamese minorities in Cambodia. Uh, so I hope this piece uh, is uh, a big contribution to the scholarship on uh, ethnic minorities in Cambodia. And uh, uh, we have uh, Christina Chum and uh, uh, Ratna. Uh, they, uh, Ratna is uh, uh, from Great Karana organization and Christina uh, Chum an advisor to, to, to the organizations and to the project. Uh, so, uh, they will discuss about this, and this is part of our uh, public lecture series uh, uh, we host here at CKS in both Phnom uh, Penh office and our sibling office. We, this program is to provide uh, a platform for for scholars, post Cambodians, and foreign scholars to present their works, their uh, research project, both the one in progress and the, the one that has been you know, finalized in whatever ways we can sing. Uh, so, so this is part of this public lecture series and uh, we will also welcome any proposal from all of you here to help uh, your, you know, your research projects is going on or, or you finish your research project then we will be to consider uh, a public uh, lecture like this. So I hope every, uh, all of you will enjoy this uh, discussion and uh, the floor is your yeah. place right now. Good evening everyone. I am the next president of the Jews, so I am a teaching officer from the Academy of uh, and I, I uh, also work on the project uh, based on uh, the issue of ethnicity or boundary conflict. So uh, this research is part of uh, my project, which uh, I uh, did with uh, under the supervision from uh, this team and yes, uh, let her uh, introduce the ceremony and she will uh, start the uh, post international level of this research, the context of the research, and we will go through to the finding and the, the thing that we will talk about what we have done with our research. This 
grow out of practic very practical work. But like on the map, it's an organization committed to peaceful conflict resolution and also this environment now to look at interethnic uh, relations here in Cambodia, becoming aware that Cambodia is indeed somehow a multi ethnic society. Also, the big majority consists of Khmer people, but you have a lot of other ethnic groups here. The biggest one you might know is the Vietnamese, the Chan, the Chinese, also those who are the indigenous people. And if we look deeper into the relationships, we certainly have to acknowledge that the relationship to each other is sometimes not really at best. And insofar, uh, the organization decided we need to um, do something for improving interethnic relationships, and they had a program uh, that actually went very well related to the Thai Cambodian or Thai Pair relationships. They organized exchange discussion with Thai students in Bangkok, and uh, Khmer students realized that things maybe are not so bad as they feared or that Thai people also are humans uh, they can talk to and can discuss uh, and they are not so much different uh, as the Khmer people themselves. And uh, in this context, uh, the Ekoguna also decided maybe we should do something related to the Vietnamese as well. Uh, because uh, you know, uh, or you might know, uh, that the recent uh, election um, brought this problem really into the limelight, uh, and it was not really nice uh, what has happened related to the Vietnamese uh, uh, ethnic group here. And uh, sometimes uh, I feel this is taken or utilized uh, somehow as a political issue too. So, and insofar, uh, the question is, is the, has it really something to do with ethnic conflict or is it rather a political issue? And this maybe makes it so difficult, especially for Khmer people, I think, um, to get involved in dealing with this issue. And I found it really hard. Um, but my intention was to make this discussion and to make this exploration really of Cambodians. It should not be done only by foreigners. They have their very specific view on it. Of course, they might have more um, distanced ways to view this problem and um, they might have uh, lesser problems in approaching uh, the issue between uh, uh, the Vietnamese and the Khmer. But I think because it is a very specific problem that the Khmer people have to tackle this, they also should gain more strength, more confidence in getting involved in this and also become more aware about their own poverty. But I think uh, many, many of them, at least when I talk to them, they have somehow stereotypes about the Vietnamese uh, um, prejudices and it makes really hard to overcome this and to have a more rational and more objective view of it. And um, based on the positive experience that uh, the organization has made uh, this type um, issue, we really tried to figure out what would be the best um, to embark on this issue. And uh, we came to the point that we said um, so little is known about the Vietnamese here in Cambodia uh, that we had to do some more research on it and to get more information, real information, not so much based on her say, on the rumors, on stereotypes, on prejudices. And we were encouraged by two authors of a very recent study as well. Some of you maybe know it, uh, a boat without anchor. And they, this is a legal study, and they looked into the legal status of Vietnamese uh, living in the Palisade. They found out, among others, 
that those are people who lived here in Cambodia already for several generations. And we found it very interesting to go to the in this mission and to look how these people really have lived here, how was the migration history somehow, and also to make Cambodian society aware that in Cambodia, not the Vietnamese live here, but they are not a homogeneous or, or, or a monolithic group that has recently immigrated uh, illegally or something like this. But this is a group, a subgroup. Um, and we found out later, we come to this, uh, that the ancestors uh, of the respondents we asked have sometimes come more than 100 years ago. And the families have a long history here uh, related to that. And um, the question was, of course, how to do what objective research. You know, as soon as we start to talk about the Vietnamese, uh, emotions run high. And uh, many Khmer people get agitated on this, uh, and sometimes uh, not so much open. Uh, related to real facts and information that is reliable. And here, uh, at this point, I got involved and I tried to advise uh, the organization. Um, I organize an organization very well experienced in the work, but much lesser experience in doing quantitative research. And we didn't want to do just a little survey with quantitative data, tick, tick, yes, no, yes, no. We really want to go uh, into the issue and wanted to explore the histories of those people and how they have lived all the decades here before they have been in 1975. And um, uh, most important was really to open up them, to train them uh, in doing quantitative research, especially we wanted to really have based our research on the uh, um, oral history approach. We wanted uh, really to get as much information from the Vietnamese uh, as possible. And insofar, researchers have to be prepared how to get involved in in-depth interviews, listen carefully to people, open up uh, the minds uh, of the people, uh, and skillfully respond uh, to what the respondents have said by asking new questions. And I think this is not really something that many of the workers are used to do. And uh, insofar we had uh, comprehensive, uh, comprehensive training before we started going into the project. Right? And we also used the opportunity in trying to do a lot of self reflection looking at oneself, and trying to figure out maybe I'm cold, what kind of stereotypes, what kind of prejudices. So to get prepared actually when meeting um, people, uh, I usually um, consider them as suspicion and do they really say the truth and uh, can I believe it or whatever. And I think for a researcher this is really necessary to take one's own emotions Side and really get open to everything that the respondents said. And this we have um, tried to really train uh, with each other and um, still the field work because in theory training is one side, but then jumping into the practice uh, and doing uh, in interviews and uh, dealing with the challenges uh, is not so easy especially for inexperienced individuals. And uh, insofar, the conceptual idea behind this research was not only to collect somehow information, but also to train and to get my people um, open-minded, jumping into the situation and get familiar with this and get trained with this uh, and uh, trying really um, to ask questions out of themselves. I didn't want to go as a foreigner there and then only use my people as assistants and say, now ask this question, ask this question, ask this question. 
particularly as we didn't need any translation into English. Main language was Khmer. And I was also surprised that many Vietnamese we interviewed could speak Khmer language. Mm -hmm. Of course, we had uh, translators Khmer Vietnamese. Sometimes, uh, I think especially in German, uh, we are not so um, familiar with Khmer language because we have no, not so much uh, interaction outside. But uh, all the men we met, I think we were from and insofar we had a very direct access to them, of course at the beginning, because uh, a little bit difficult to open up both sides, to get the Khmer really ready and listening carefully, and also the Vietnamese Khmer uh, have thought why many people want to interview us. What kind of information do we want to find out? What? what are we doing with this information? So we had to overcome suspicion mutual suspicion to and insofar we decided to stay overnight in the communities um, so that we also had informal interacting with them, we could observe uh, their general lives, how it was, uh, and we get much more familiar with this. Sometimes uh, it was not able to come back, <laughs> especially in the nights. Uh, I was not used really to my on boot. So this is only to explain a little bit that you don't 
expect too much of analyzers we have. We can't really say anything specific about the relationship between Khan and Vietnamese yet. We have really focused and concentrated on of exploring what have they experienced in the past. And we had methodology methodology be two ways. First we asked them everything related to their childhood and youth until they got married. So everything they could really um, remember by themselves somehow, recall by themselves and they had experience. And I was surprised. We found at least two respondents they were older than 18 years and we could go far, far back until the Japanese occupation times. So in the 40s, early 40s. Very interesting. They experienced this time as 10, 12 years old boys. And it was really interesting to see how they have experienced and uh, maybe we can later do that. Uh, maybe explain their land, uh, and their villages, obviously. Um, where uh, in an, or is located uh, or where located in an area that was of high strategic importance. All the war times, be it um, um, World War II, be it um, the struggle for national independence, uh, be it uh, um, the Manol administration and, and, and uh, other resistance uh, against French war. Every time we could found there were heavy historical issues uh, we could remember. They are some more important history. Okay, and uh, most important too, I would like to say, is uh, that we always tried to leave our outside perspective and to indulge to delve into the inside perspective, to the inside view and to the listen and really to accept what the Vietnamese said to us without judging anything, without uh, just really to be open and to learn how to be open and how to listen and uh, try to cope with one's own emotion. And uh, Badana will say later something about he has felt sometimes uh, during this and this will confirm uh, actually how hard it is uh, so far maybe um, to the introduction and to the program framework. Yeah, I met a uh, very good limitation of the research. I regret it a little bit that we have very, very short time for processing the information. We have much more information than we do can find here. Uh, but we have dozens of transcripts and we have also uh, asked actually about searching issues. Um, a bone raising, for example, and uh, because we wanted to approach uh, how uh, they have interacted with my people, but we were not able really um, to put this information in this report yet. Uh, and uh, actually, the first draft of the report was much longer, but because of the limitation of the number of pages, we also had to reduce it. Um, but I hope you get through this um, to our next report. Uh, we are sure uh, that we will continue and uh, do a further research process. Thank you for your overall discussion about our research and uh, what is the purpose behind this uh, research. And, um, to continue our uh, work with the findings, uh, we found in this research and we will switch a uh, few time between me and Christina and like I uh, mentioned that uh, at the very end I will share my experience, my like emotional reaction, sometimes during the field interview with them and maybe uh, one of our team is here also. Uh, maybe he can share what uh, he was feeling or how he was emotionally feel of things during uh, with uh, those Vietnamese people. So um, the finding I will focus on uh, some main purpose, homeland, 
uh, their livelihood and some kind of uh, immigration fee that they uh, encountered during the past time, which called Langtai during that time. And that all will be some even, as history called, even uh, covered by Christina and uh, reflection. So, um, as you see in this uh, map, um, actually, those of Vietnamese people currently they are living in uh, two villages uh, in Ho Chi Minh town, Chong Co and Chong Co and Phan Dang villages around here. But uh, they were born and lived in many uh, different villages around the areas of the Lesa River, like you see here. Spot, the red spot is the uh, other uh, village, uh, villages that uh, those Vietnamese were born during uh, uh, the past time. And uh, it, it's a far, far lost to, from the uh, Bochna town, mostly, and some around uh, close to the Bochna town. And uh, not only uh, those villages, not only uh, homeland of uh, our respondent, but to other uh, Vietnamese family, many other Vietnamese family who uh, uh, lived in the past time uh, before my Ocean in 1975. And actually, they were born there because uh, their first uh, ancestor uh, came uh, reportedly from our respondent. It came uh, since the uh, late 19th century. During the uh, French colonial time, and, and before 1925, uh, interestingly, noticeably, uh, we focus, we we uh, focus with the uh, Prolimius uh, village that is uh, the where of a large uh, settlement of Mai and Vietnamese and some Chinese people living there, and our uh, life was. Uh, Lives are very busy with the business in that uh, settlement. It is, you can say it is a central settlement uh, beside Kompongchnan Market in Kompongchnan town. So this uh, village, Prolimia, uh, is uh, accessible for the trading from other villages nearby, not only for the local uh, business of trading for people and mainly uh, only Chinese um, uh, people, my people that uh, um, have a uh, business but uh, for those uh, Vietnamese people mostly they were uh, Christian I will, uh, men I will talk more about their livelihood and yes, uh, beside the libraries a big settlement during that time and the villages around of Bolivia and somehow between uh, Bolivia's village and Kumpung Chinang town and somewhere close to Kumpung Chinang town uh, were smaller settlement of Vietnamese people Vietnamese people settlement and uh, it's not like a busy like it's not like busy as a uh, uh, Bolivia or in Kumpung Chinang market and uh, mostly those uh, villages uh, were flooded, completely flooded during the uh, rainy season. And so uh, people have, like, especially the Vietnamese people who live uh, on the area, have somehow moved their floating house or their boat to uh, other locations uh, accordingly uh, to the areas. And most uh, villages, uh, they access to the library uh, for uh, like uh, villagers from uh, other villages they have to grow their boat to the libraries because in their village they don't have a market so uh, somehow they have to go to the library or Kunshan town for any uh, household supply or any needed material that they need uh, for their life um, and what is uh, surprising to us uh, from this uh, research 
from some villages that were homeland of those Vietnamese people. Uh, now they are, uh, don't exist uh, anymore, and uh, it, they become uh, desert. And now I'm used by uh, my family for uh, agriculture activity, growing green especially. Yes, uh, likely after 1975, after my roots teaching, that uh, those uh, religious uh, both any religious to live anymore. And so, this uh, we, I, I don't uh, go more detail, but uh, this whole land, maybe we can uh, talk later to in our question and answer. So, now let's move to the livelihood. In the past, uh, mentioned again, but uh, at the current uh, situation of current uh, life, um, most of, of those Vietnamese people uh, are fishermen originally from their ancestors, and so uh, they had their own rowboat, their own fishing boat, at some time when they were far from their village for two, three or five days sometimes to fish and come back they um, to fish or to catch or let from uh, family's need they sold it to the market or sometimes to the middleman um, according to the price uh, they uh, uh, agree with the middleman sometimes it's uh, Enough to a certain, or sometimes uh, uh, cheap, uh, so they sold at the market directly. And besides, I uh, want to uh, also uh, stress here it, with the uh, fishermen and also for other family, Vietnamese family, um, they encounter uh, some hardship or difficulty during uh, life born in season that they cannot um, go fishing as uh, uh, free as uh, they used to be to, to uh, do. Um, so also the weather is also some kind of uh, challenging of their life. Uh, uh, they report that uh, some years, few years, um, one or two years that uh, they there was there were a big storm. They even cannot go out for fishing or even go out from their house. And this uh, really uh, made their livelihood uh, in a hardship uh, experience. And also uh, another factor that made their life uh, seem uh, difficult with out the challenges. So as about the, the fee, the immigration fee, I will talk later. And beside the fishermen, mostly fishermen, our family, just a few family they have, yeah. they, they also had a fishing lot. It's a kind of a quite big business. They have, a, they have sometimes 50 to 60 workers for their fishing lot. Vietnamese, uh, Vietnamese uh, fishing lot owner and they sold this fish uh, once a year to Phnom Penh market to market in Phnom Penh and linked to this uh, fishing lot it uh, also produced uh, some uh, labor work for other Vietnamese many other Vietnamese people they uh, work as a worker laborer for the fishing lot owner and also uh, some people, uh, some Vietnamese uh, family who live around uh, for life years uh, a big, after the large settlement uh, they also have uh, their own business like uh, they have clothes they run the they rent the clothes off and they trade the goods from the Vietnam market to uh, sell in the uh, Palamese market. 
So, but uh, very few families have uh, this kind of uh, business that those families, they are living in this world, world um, in better situations and comfortable life better than most other people who, uh, who, who have their profession, have profession as a uh, fisherman. And also, uh, some people, they produce the uh, like this product, like with sauce, with pest, or um, cook fish, that they can load in, like they call, or they call it kind of Korean food. Uh, they produce kind of uh, food product and sell to other people in uh, what is called uh, villages, and sometimes they just a butter for uh, other products like rice or other thing that uh, those Vietnamese people cannot produce by themselves. This is uh, some profession of uh, what they uh, did. <coughs> and many other uh, profession that they uh, did for their livelihood, but not much of, not, not much family, not many family that uh, 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 did it. Mostly they were fishermen. Like uh, some Vietnamese family also uh, own their land during that time, during this time, and they cultivate the land. They grew they uh, bean, corn, and even later, they, when they uh, stopped using the land, they also rent, rent land to uh, other uh, people to uh, grow. Which at the world, so they still earn, uh, earn uh, income from the land. Just few people that uh, have it, have this, and some people also keep animal uh, for their own uh, family or occasionally uh, sold to uh, Chinese women, uh, and sometimes some people also like as a craftsman, carpenter. So uh, this is uh, roughly about the profession of the livelihood in the past of those uh, Vietnamese people. Then uh, let's move to uh, immigration fee that we call Lan Dai during uh, that previous time before uh, 1925. Um, Maybe uh, it, it was uh, lasted uh, until 1960s, reportedly from our respondent. And this uh, immigration fee is a kind of um, fee for foreigners, like Chinese people, for Vietnamese people, especially because uh, uh, most of Vietnamese family were here during that time. So, at when they got 18 years old, they have to pay uh, like uh, starting in 1940s, 47 or 48, it was uh, 300 real, and it go up until uh, 1950 to 1960s, go up, uh, went up to uh, 750 real in the past time. Uh, comparing to now, it would be uh, $250, US dollars. And it, is, it was a quite uh, high uh, amount of money that those Vietnamese people would uh, struggle to uh, pay each <coughs> year. So, um, sometimes the, they cannot afford to pay for this immigration fee. Uh, sometimes they have uh, many members in the family that uh, uh, were at the age uh, in obligation to pay this uh, fee, so they cannot afford. And so some uh, frequently, uh, uh, oftenly, uh, their family members have to escape. Sometimes escape when the police came to collect the fee, so they escaped for a while and 
uh, when the police uh, went back, they returned back to their house, to their village. And if, in case that uh, police are uh, arrested, when police arrested, because they cannot afford the, the immigration fee on time, uh, they have to maybe stay uh, some in the prison sometime or they have to uh, double pay the uh, fee. Like uh, 750, they have to pay uh, two times. And this is uh, a burden for uh, those uh, Vietnamese, especially uh, the fisherman family, uh, beside the uh, waiver issues, beside uh, like, uh, some uh, forbidden uh, season that they cannot go fishing freely. And also, this is kind of uh, history or even that. Uh, those Vietnamese people uh, get through and more historical even will Christina will uh, illustrate what was the uh, traveling of uh, those Vietnamese people throughout our history.
um, um, Ratanak mentioned it already, the livelihood, that you uh, also had already somehow gaps uh, in, in, the, in the social level. You had a lot of fishermen families, quite poor. They could really earn day by day the food and everything uh, necessary for the families, but couldn't really amass uh, something. And then few families, um, they were sellers or they were really retailers. Um, they bought um, uh, goods uh, from Kompochnam and uh, they sold it uh, to Amir. Uh, they had no problems. And surprisingly, also we found, especially grandparents, owned obviously fishing lots. And also the first generation had obviously no problems when they came to Cambodia and to live on land. They had still houses on the riverbanks uh, and that's why they also uh, were able to grow uh, or to feed um, um, animals like ducks or, or um, um, chickens or sometimes even pigs. And the following generations, we found out uh, let's say uh, to the end of the 20s uh, and the 30s, they moved more and more to floating houses. And um, the one respondent, uh, 83 years old, he told us his grandfather um, died at the age of 99 years old. And he was at that time 17 years old. So when we count back, and uh, this respondent said to us um, his grandfather was born, in Pralamia, it must mean that he was born in 1850s somewhere or so. So this was even before the following times, but this was only one. And still, uh, this is what the respondents told us, but we have at the moment not yet any means really to verify the exact dates. But it was really, really interesting to see how also the livelihood might have changed for the first generations, uh, for the next generations, uh, and also the living conditions. And it seems that the first generation, uh, at least what the 38, uh, the 83 old years old man told to us, he found it quite pleasant as a child, also uh, his family never had really much money, uh, but um, the forest uh, around Polymia was thick and they went uh, to the flooded forest and his grandfather also was a snake catcher, pythons, sometimes uh, quite big pythons. And as a young boy he often accompanied his grandfather and he enjoyed really um, um, going by boat uh, to the flooded forest and he observed uh, wild animals. And Birds, for example, uh, they caught also young birds, uh, feed them at home uh, until they get to eat them. Uh, so, um, several respondents made an impression, at least on me, uh, that they enjoyed somehow uh, the life. It was quite free. Uh, that there are no regulations uh, or little, uh, uh, actually little competition. It was easy to occupy land. And no local authorities came or um, uh, made uh, somehow uh, um, difficulties or problems with them. Uh, and this changed over the decades, uh, and of course, uh, when they got involved more and more also with the historical events. And um, insofar, uh, I would say it's really hard now um, to tell you all the details we got. Uh, from our respondents uh, related to the historical uh, events uh, because this was also part of our research. We wanted to know from them what they have kept in their mind uh, specifically. Of course, the 70 years were most frozen, uh, present to them, but we also um, 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 could manage uh, to go back, back, as I said, uh, far into the uh, Japanese occupation. Uh, and uh, it seems that uh, at that time the area was not really much populated. Uh, and uh, here in Palir, for example, uh, was one settlement. Um, it seems to me it was one of the most old, or the, the oldest, uh, and a complete Vietnamese settlement. Only one Cambodian family, Khmer family, has lived with them. This was uh, close to the Gong uh, Nghien uh, mountain. Yeah. 